Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I will start with a couple of personal notes. That first, this is an, BBRF is an amazing organization. And again, my career would have not happened if I was not awarded, if were not awarded the award in 2002. That was the first grant I ever received. And it is really an honor to stand here. The second is that I have to thank you. Thank you for recognizing what we are doing at Special Olympics International. And you will see that there are so many parallels between BBRF and our organization, Special Olympics International. The way that we grew out of nothing all the way to what we do today. With also, I want to congratulate all the other presenters today and the award winners. Uh, you are amazing, and it is just showcasing uh, what a wonderful growth this organization, BBRF, has uh, achieved and the impact that it makes on our daily lives. So with that, so um, how did it begin? Well, in the 60s, it became basically, it was simply a summer camp for about less than a dozen kids, actually. It was in a backyard by a visionary. And Eunice Kennedy Schreiber is all well known to all of you. And uh, she basically had this vision, a vision of a better, juster world for everyone with intellectual disabilities. And this were, these were the first uh, pictures from a summer camp. And the tradition continued, and the organization grew. And where are we today? So from the 60s to today, 5 million athletes, 200 countries, 30 different sports, more than 1 million volunteers, more than 100,000 competitions. And we are basically the world's largest sports organization for people with intellectual disabilities. This summer, this picture is uh, from the uh, summer games, uh, which were held in Berlin. And this was an amazing event. Uh, event. I walked in with all the athletes in the stadium. There is, I can't describe the feeling when there are 70,000 spectators cheering in the same stadium where Hitler refused to shake the hand of Jesse Owens. That has really, that just shows how far we have come. So, but this is the world distribution. We are not a US-based organization. Uh, we have a strong, strong presence in the US, but as you can see, we are present pretty much everywhere. COVID gave us a little bit hard time, but we are recovering very well. And if we go on, it is clear that about, about uh, 20, more than 20 years ago, it became apparent that we should probably just not be a sport organization and an advocacy organization, but much more. Our athletes have unmet needs. And those unmet needs are even much worse than the typical population. So if you look at it, tooth decay, oops, uh, let me see, tooth decay, eye disease, flexibility, failing hear, uh, hearing tests, and so on. And a lot of our athletes cannot communicate with the traditional means. So uh, there is one study, sort of more at this point not published, but it's an anecdotal study that imagine if you have an unmet dental need and you live in pain 
constant pain. And you can't tell about it because you are not verbal. And nobody knows about it. And once this is uh, remedied, this is, uh, the filling has been done, the dental need has been attended, guess what? The behavioral problems go away. And then you recognize that all of this is connected. That living in pain actually makes sense that it will lead to behavioral deficits, right? So, um, and in 97, it was time to start addressing the healthcare needs. And this initially happened in the United States and then it started to expand and now it is over two million screenings in 135 countries. Nine medical disciplines and COVID, we are getting back from the figures before uh, from COVID. And um, we are basically going more comprehensive and developing further all these assessments and referral processes for our athletes. So, what are we seeing as a result of the health programming? 50% reduction in mouth pain, uh, uh, in decay. 60% uh, uh, show normalized blood pressure. 30% um, less healthcare visits. Um, then you have that three times less cost for the society if you address their need. This is pre true prevention. And, oops, no, no, I'm pushing the wrong buttons. So, and ultimately, um, if you look at it, that we are getting to a better health status based on the World Health Organization guidelines to our athletes. So, how about mental and intellectual uh, disability, mental health and intellectual disabilities? It is darn high about 30%. And you have pretty much everything that you can find in our population, in the general population, just with a somewhat higher frequency. And uh, we are seeing a huge issue that practitioners are not prepared to treat. Someone who is not verbal, someone who has a diagnosis of Down syndrome, uh, someone who has stereotypic behaviors and so on. And not only them, but the society to the large degree is not really ready to treat them equally. Think about the workforce at your workplace. If they get an employment and they see the atypical movements and atypical behaviors. Or for that matter, we know that police can misinterpret very much their behavior. So this is a significant problem. Um, and what ends up is that three times more likely to have a history of criminal, why is it jumping on me? So uh, three times more likely to have a history of criminal charges uh, than the typical population, and it's just basically, or to be victims of crime, which is also very common, and sexual crimes are also quite common. So, the Strong Mind, to try to remedy this, the Strong Minds program started in 2010, and it is focusing on emotional well-being uh, and learning, and developing active coping skills, and at the Berlin Olympic Games, we screened 16,000 participants uh, for all the different areas of health, including mental health. And uh, since 2011, I think that it's now, the number is much higher, but at least outside the Berlin Olympic Games, we screened about 19,000 unique individuals. And as a result of what we are doing, uh, 
70% of our athletes are now using active coping strategies. And again, that is the part of the prevention. So, now what are we currently doing on uh, mental and behavioral health is that we are further revising all the protocols and implementing the new protocols. And we will receive feedback and see. Uh, one of our challenges is always that we are international. A lot of countries, over 200 countries, over a very different ethnic population, very different local laws, uh, very different languages. And that is a significant challenge, but this award will actually allow us to expand the activities. This general, uh, generous support uh, from BBRF will allow us to implement new behavioral health protocols in 25 existing countries, and we, we, add, and we are very much hopeful to add another 15 countries to this uh, in the next couple of years, and expand and include in the electronic health record systems, then um, basically expand it everywhere and pathways for care. It's not enough just to identify the issues, but how do you translate it to local care for everyone? And um, ult ultimately monitor and disseminate all the findings and publish so that we have some track records and significant science behind it, what works and what doesn't. So with this, I know that I'm the only one standing before you and lunch, uh, in, uh, be, between you and lunch, so <laughs> thank you from the bottom of my heart and thank you on the behalf of our half, five million athletes, all the volunteers, and just know that you are making a difference in the life of the patients it's not about us researchers. It's about the ones who we serve. And this is the power of uh, basically BBRF. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Just because we may, we may be hungry, we don't would have to give up a few questions for Caroli. I have the first one, actually. How did you get interested in this? in developmental disabilities or in Special Olympics. Special Olympics. So at, um, I initially, now again I can give a couple sentence answer or a long answer. The bottom line is around age of 40, 45, we all ask that what do we leave behind us and how we can most contribute to the world and how do we change the world. And at that point, um, I started to take on administrative duties and I became the associate director of the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center. And uh, we were celebrating our 50th anniversary about 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And um, our keynote speaker was Tim Schreiber, oh. and uh, who is now the chairman of the board for Special Olympics International and doing an amazing job. And then Tim and I are started to talk and started to develop ideas and so on. And one thing led to another. And then he asked me to join the board. And then I was the co-chair of the research and the policy committee for several years. And now I'm the chair of the global medical advisory committee for the world. So, um, and it's sort of one thing led to another. And I felt my passion grow, honestly. Over time. So Schreiber caught you in a vulnerable moment, a plastic moment of the yes, brain. Yes, I would say so, yes. <laughs> Questions? Thank you very much. I applaud the work you do uh, in your Thank organization you. for these very special people. How much support do you get from the organized sports world? For instance, the NFL, $15 billion a year enterprise or, or corporations, but particularly the sports world, NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball. Okay, now I'm on, I have the microphone and the camera is on me, <laughs> so I have to be very careful. 
I will have to be very careful with my answer. And I will say this, that certainly not as much as we should, um, in my mind. But again, that's my personal view. Um, we do get support. So Wolf uh, from uh, ESPN is, uh, Dick Wolf is a big supporter. He's on our board. He, uh, so sort of, I would say that there are individuals that are very strong supporters of our organization. Uh, does it everywhere, every time translate to money, which we need for our activity? Probably not. But again, there are amazing individuals from Dikembe Mutombo, who was on our board, to some other very prominent uh, professional athletes uh, who care, deeply care about our cause. But again, is that sort of permeating all aspects of the professional world and the business of professional world, I think that they could do a little bit more. But again, you know, the need is always in the society endless and the resources are always limited. So I have, we have to be grateful for their support at this point. No more questions. I would um, say that we'll uh, we'll we we'll yeah. one. Oh. I wear many different hats. I'm running the second largest intellectual and developmental disability institute in the world with 13 departments, 570 employees. So sort of this was the, so what inspired me when I started initially, I think it was both curiosity and the quest for justice. Um, and the first thing that I always was thinking about it when we talk about diversity Somehow, intellectual and developmental disabilities are left off the list. And that always bothered me. Uh, that was one. Um, the second is curiosity. I wanted to understand, first, how the processes arise, what is happening in the brain and the body, and is there a chance to remedy and help and improve certain aspect of functioning. And that's why I'm both a researcher, an administrator, and a community advocate. Because I think that those three should go together if you want to make a real impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.